all right. Oh, can I pop? Well, I... so hello all. So we're gonna, um, so I wanna talk about auditioning. Um, this, was a, this was a request, um, I believe first from Bethany, but I've had some follow-ups. Um, and uh, it's a good thing to talk about. I understand that, you know, there, there's not much auditioning happening right now, but I also understand that obviously this is our through way into the work. Uh, and it's something where I do think I have things to offer. Um, it's not the same sort of craft I feel like I have to offer in terms of looking at Shakespeare's work and um, the sort of specificity and technicality of, of pieces of the craft that I think will open the work up for you more. Um, but I, I am a professional actor. I, I have 20 plus years of experience doing this and auditioning. So I hope I have some things to offer. I, I, I am by no means an expert. Um, I'm going to spend tonight talking about the actual process of auditioning. And I think I'll spend next week talking about the exterior things to auditioning, including finding and getting auditions, including networking. Um, next week's lecture, I think I might have more to share that perhaps you know a bit less of or might have less experience with. Um, a lot of what I may have to say tonight, you may already know. Um, you may know better than I. Um, so I'm going to offer my experience and I'll take questions at the end and I would, I, I, I hope it'll be helpful. Um, but I will say that I'm, I'm on, I, I'm, I'm by no means an expert. Um, on a personal note, um, I, at this point in my career, pre COVID at least, who knows what's going to happen after all this, but I was auditioning for about 20% of the jobs I was working. About 80% of the jobs I work these days, I, I'm just getting offers from directors or artistic directors. I'm proud of that. It's a good place to be. Um, but I do get about 20% of my work from auditions. And with that said, maybe I get a job every 20, 25 auditions. Um, you know, sometimes you go on hot streaks, sometimes you go on cold streaks. Um, but um, it's a major thing I'll keep coming back to. Your, most auditions you have, you're not gonna book it. Um, and coming to some sort of peace with that, and it's a hard thing to come to peace with sometimes, uh, will make your auditioning life and your professional life a lot better. Um, so I'm speaking from my own experience, um, and I hope some of what I have to say will be helpful. Um, so, and also, this applies to all auditions. I'm gonna focus on classical work and there are some things that are specific to it. Um, but I think a lot of this applies to, to auditioning in general. So um, first and most obvious is preparedness. Um, do your work. All the things we're doing in class, and I won't do a, a list of it, but all the lectures we've done, all the things we've focused on, these are things you need to do in preparation for an audition, especially for a classical audition. Um, you are fighting for the auditor's ears uh, in the same way that you're fighting for an audience's. Now, there are differences. The auditors, if you're auditioning for a part specifically, they've probably heard a dozen other people that day. If you're doing an open call, they may have heard hundreds. So it's hard. I've been, I've auditioned hundreds of times and I've auditioned, I've been behind the table both as a director and as a producer and sometimes as a reader. Um, and it is hard to keep your focus. It is tough. Um, good actors come in, you zone out. Um, you, need to, you need to seize their ear in the same way you need to take an audience's. Now, the auditors may have a bit more goodwill towards you. I would certainly hope they do. Um, I would hope that they, this isn't universally true, but many love and respect artists, they're theater makers, they want you to do well. So maybe you get a bit more goodwill from them than you do from some audiences. But all the same, they've heard dozens or up to hundreds of people and you're fighting for their ears. So that's part of the preparedness, that's part of the craft I'm trying to offer in the class is creating interesting, exciting work, using the verse, the prose, et cetera, um, constantly fighting for their ears. And so the work we're doing in class is essential to a good classical audition. Um, 
and the work we do on monologues and scenes. That's the kind of building work you want to do on your pieces. Um, now, if you're lucky enough to have sides, um, get off book, uh, assuming you have more than a day or two. If you have a day or two, do your best. Um, but if you have some time to prep, get off book. I would still hold your sides. I always do. A, they're a nice little crutch and a reminder that this is just an audition. This isn't a fully formed performance. Um, and they're there to glance at if you do go up. Um, and this seems silly, but they are something to do with your hands, um, which can be kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. Um, so you have the paper in your hand. So keep the sides, but get off book. Um, and not only get off book, but know your cues. Don't make your audition in the room with a reader the first time you're hearing somebody else give you your cues. Get somebody to help you record them yourself, whatever the method is. Um, uh, don't, let the, don't let it be for the first time in the room. Similarly with a monologue, you don't have to work out your cues, but if it's a specific monologue you've been asked to prepare, be off book, hold the side, and make sure you've done it good and aloud on your own time a few times. Don't, don't let the audition be your first full voiced experience because it will change things. Um, I personally need to build a prep schedule. I schedule my, my time in preparation for an audition. If I don't, I fuck it up. Um, and I end up in a rush near the end. Um, not everybody may need this. It's what works for me. Um, so that's when you're lucky enough to have sides or, or a requested monologue. Often you have to per just prepare a piece. This is either for open calls, um, which I still do and I encourage you to do, even though sometimes they feel hellish and um, worthless, but I have booked some jobs from them. It does happen. And you are getting some face time with casting directors and directors. So I, I would encourage you to keep keep go going to them if, if you have the energy for it. Um, but you do have to pick your own piece. Now, in this case, you should be off book and you shouldn't have any sides. I mean, this is a prepared piece. The other thing about this piece is you've got, you should have multiple pieces and plenty of time to prep them. Um, so there's really, there's less of an excuse for a lack of preparation. Um, for these pieces, I would recommend that they are all short. Go with short. You're fighting for some burned out auditor's attention. I used to, as a younger actor, I would get angry when I saw calls that asked for one minute Shakespeare monologues because my feeling was all the good ones are at least a minute and a half, two minutes kind of things. That's, and that's not untrue, although there are some good short ones. But spending years auditioning people now, I, I've, I make a decision about an actor within about 20 seconds. Um, and I think that's true for most auditioners. You're, you're not gonna convince them at minute, at one minute and 20 seconds to hire you. They've, they've made a decision. So knowing what that attention span is, you wanna lock it up in the first 30 seconds. Now the monologue can be 45 seconds a minute, but that is the time frame I would encourage you to aim for. And I know that that takes a lot of good things off the table, um, but I do think you're doing yourself a service. Um, you're asking less of their attention for which they will be thankful, hopefully. Um, and you're putting less pressure on yourself. Go in, knock it out, and get out of there. Um, and I would encourage you to pick a piece that reflects the character you would like to be cast in. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be the character, although I'm all for that. I often prepare monologues for characters I'm interested in. Um, and I would encourage, uh, encourage you to go that route. However, please, please, please read the instructions on the breakdown. There's nothing that will drive the auditors more crazy than you ignoring that. They will sometimes say, please don't do a piece from the show. Um, so be aware of that. If they don't say that, it should be an option for you. Um, and especially for the ladies out there, although for everyone, I, I think, gen I think gender bending for monologues is great. I, I say go for it. Um, but that doesn't overrule the most important thing, which is to reflect the character you wanna be cast as. So if you're auditioning for a Hamlet and your hope is to be considered for Ophelia, doing your favorite Iago monologue is no good. It's not gonna get you there. That has nothing to do with the fact that you couldn't do an Iago monologue for something else. Um, but the character does, just doesn't line up with Ophelia. So the real point here is you wanna make it as easy as possible 
for the auditors to see you in the part. You want to shorten the gap between you and the part you want to play as much as you can for them. So pick a part that is easy for them or pick a piece that's easy for them to see you in the part for. Make it short so that you're not burning them out. Um, just take away all the barriers you can. And I'll come back to this, but these are the things you can control. There are so many things you can't control. These things you can control, so control them. Um, briefly, at the audition, I would encourage you to do whatever you can to relieve your stress. Um, some people have attitudes about this, I don't. I, if you wanna be social and chat with other actors you know at an audition, I encourage you to do so. Don't let it distract you too much, but if that's how you can just get some of the nerves loosened, go for it. Some people like to stretch, some people like to sit alone in the corner staring at their sides, whatever works for you, but make sure it's reducing your stress, not increasing it. There are people you'll see staring at sides, sweating bullets, and it's like, that is clearly not helping you. When you go into the room, your adrenaline's gonna be up a bit, hopefully, um, unless you, you're insanely balanced in some way I don't understand. Um, so that kind of energy, that perk up of the audition is going to happen. Do what you can to take the other barriers out of your way. So whatever, how, whatever you can do to relax outside the room, do it. Um, remind yourself, and this is related to stress, that you're probably not gonna book it. And if you can come to peace with that, it will save you so much heartache and pain. You probably are not gonna book it. That is true of every audition you walk in on. The odds are you won't book it. Um, that sounds awful. You have to come to terms with a world of rejection if you wanna work in, uh, if you wanna be an actor. Um, and I find peace in reminding myself that I probably won't book it. Um, little things, once you get there, turn off your phone, put all your stuff in an easy package that you can either leave safely out in the room or you can bring into the room and just put down. Take away all the little things that could pop up and stress you out. Um, Presentation, I won't go down a large rabbit hole on this. Um, uh, you should have a headshot and resume. Yes, in this digital world, you can be forgiven, but it looks unprofessional not to. You should have one. Um, yeah, get a good picture. Uh, the picture should look like you and, I, and everybody likes to look good. Uh, I think headshots are less important than people put a lot of emphasis on. Um, a lot of their job is to get you in the door. Once you're at the audition, it means less, but the people auditioning you, if you're in the good pile, they are gonna stare at that shot for a while. So yes, ideally you want a good pick. They can be expensive. My favorite headshot photographer is ridiculously expensive. Is it worth it? I don't know. But get, it, but get a good picture, have them at multiple copies and have them in your car. Don't show up at an audition without them. Um, for your resume, just make it look nice and clean. I'm gonna address this next week. The most important thing on your resume is the people you've worked with. It's more important than the plays, it's more important than the parts, and it's more important than, uh, it. well, the theaters you worked at are good, but it's the people you've worked with. If I could only put one thing on my resume, it would just be a list of all the directors uh, I have worked with, that's it. Maybe head, you know, maybe I would add artistic directors, but um, that's it. Those are the most important things on your resume. Um, now, put other things, put the roles you played and in what plays, but make sure on your resume are the people you've worked with, especially the directors. Um, make the whole experience quick, simple, and professional. Walk into the room, introduce yourself, introduce your pieces, do them, thank them, and walk out. If they wanna to talk to you, that's great. Be yourself, but be yourself briefly. Do not take an invitation to chat as an invitation to go on. Be courteous. Uh, you know, if they're bringing up somebody you both know, you could tell a quick anecdote, but don't take it as an invitation to stay and have a long conversation. Now, if they keep the conversation going, then stay. That's wonderful. Um, but don't get, don't get too excited. Just take it as a nice sign and then thank them and go. Keep it quick, clean, and professional. It's good for two reasons. It's good for them. And by God, it's good for you. It's good for your mental health to keep these quick, professional, simple, and separate. Walk out of the room, leave it behind, move on. Um, it's not always possible, um, but when it is, it will help you. And if you can sort of build, build a structure to that, um, I think it'll help your sanity. Um, 
very some little stuff or in the room don't address monologues to the auditors don't do it um uh, pick a good spot for your eyeline ideally somewhere in the middle of them or above them but not close enough to be confused with looking at one of them and deliver it to your invisible partner um get to the audition early be prepared to leave late um i hear actors complain about this all the time Again, you can only control what you can control. Auditions do run late. It sucks and it screws up your schedule. That's out of your control. You can either have a good attitude about it or a bad attitude. I promise a bad attitude is not gonna help you in the room. So get there a bit early so you don't stress and try to leave your schedule open to stay late. And if you literally can't, just don't stress about it. Say, I'm so sorry, I have to go and go. Um, but be prepared. be prepared for things to run behind because they often do. Uh, and finally, write down the names of the auditors in the room, especially the director, artistic director, and casting director. We'll talk about it next week, but you are going to follow up with them, um, at least a little card or something. So write down their names. It's also good for you to remember who you've auditioned for in the past. Um, for audition videos, um, uh, this is new for me, but I'm starting to encourage people to slate in person. Um, of course, you can edit it now and it'll just give you the name and the pieces. Um, I've gotten enough feedback from CDs that they like, a, many like a slate. They like this, they like this very brief moment to sort of meet you um, because audition videos are even more cold and impersonal than, uh, than open calls in a room. So when you, so give it a quick slate. Hi, I'm Charles. Uh, thanks for seeing me. I'm gonna, these are the pieces I'm going to do. Uh, and, and, you know, cut to the pieces. Um, look, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole on vids. So these are just some quick things. Light well, get some front light. A ring light's a good idea, but however you get light, get to a window and get some natural light in the middle of the day. Don't overstress it. Do the best you can and let the rest go. Um, for normal auditions, I don't use a mic. If you're doing musical auditions, you probably do have to use a mic. That's a separate world and I feel deep empathy for it. I don't worry about it. Um, follow the rules of the breakdown. If they give you a time limit, follow it. Don't ignore it. Don't give them any reason to disqualify you because if they get 500 videos, they're looking for any reason to disqualify people just to thin the field. Don't give them any reason to disqualify you. Um, for your own sanity, limit your takes. I stop myself at three. If I watch those three and I think, man, I really didn't get it, I'll give myself a few more, but that is very rare. Look at the three, pick the best and be done. Especially nowadays when there's so many videos and when you can self-motivate and get a bunch of people to accept videos, um, I would encourage you in your career to make it a regular thing. But for that to be a regular thing without A, driving you crazy and B, eating up hours and hours every day, you have to make it quick, concise, and simple. Um, be a professional, do a few takes, pick the best, edit it. Editing can be a little intimidating if you haven't done it before. I can edit a video on my iPhone in about five minutes now. The technology is very easy. Again, if you need to edit sound, it does get more complicated and I'm sorry. I don't have much advice about that. It's just gonna take more time. If you're just editing video, you can do it on an iPhone. It's very simple. Um, and with vids, like auditions in person, I schedule. I put the due date of the vid in my calendar. I start from the date I'm at and I build a schedule from that date to the audition date. Um, that's, the pro that's the process that, has, that gets me the most prepared. Um, so bigger stuff, as well as you can, don't overstress any singular audition. Um, that is harder if you're only auditioning for one thing every few months. I get that. It's harder if you've been working for years and all of a sudden you've got a really big audition, something that you really care about. It's harder. This rule cannot always be followed, um, but as best you can, don't overstress any singular audition. Um, know that you probably aren't going to get it. Um, and your sanity and emotional health uh, will, will be in much better shape um, if you try not to do that. If necessary, I'd give yourself 24 hours to mourn. 
um, 24 hours to be bitter, to drink too much, to talk shit, to voice it, to talk to a friend about it, get it out. If it's really fucking you up, get it out so that you can be done with it. Uh, give yourself 24 hours and then wake up and be done with it. Um, and that is easier if you surround yourself with opportunities. Um, I cold call theaters all the time to send in videos. Now, I am, now, with my career, with my resume, at this point, that is easier. I will get more response than, than, than some that may not have a resume as, as built as mine is, but you got nothing to lose. Um, we'll talk about this next week, but it's also about knowing what you want. If you live in Los Angeles and you're looking to make a living on film and TV, then your theater networking is very different because it doesn't matter how much they pay you. You don't give a shit. That's not your living. Um, you want to work with just the best theaters that are in LA. If you want to build a career as a regional theater actor, then what they pay you does matter. And the status of theaters matters. Um, if you live in a regional place, you have more options than you think. I, I, I don't, not, not than you think per se, but I think there are more options than the world had even 10 years ago when videos were rarer. And again, we'll talk about this next week, but from a regional place, you can map cities and theaters within striking distance and start reaching out to try to build bridges and connections with those theaters and with the casting people at those theaters. Again, that'll be a discussion next week, but know what you're after. Um, and when you do, you can start hunting down auditions. And if you surround yourself with more auditions then the singular ones you don't book will hurt less. Because it wasn't just, it wasn't like the one opportunity. There are more. Um, and then I'll repeat something I said earlier, which is that you can only control what you can control. There are so many factors, and I won't go down the rabbit hole of them, but you read a breakdown and you hate that they're looking for somebody with any, with specific qualifications. It could be anything. Um, and I'm not saying you hate it. I'm saying that it can, it, you, it can be frustrating to feel like there are barriers against the work you wanna do. Um, it can be frustrating for an audition to run long. Uh, it can be frustrating not to get called in for something that you really wanna be seen for. I'm not saying these things aren't true. And I'm not saying there, there might not be work that can be done to make them better in the world at large, but in your career as an actor facing this specific audition or this specific audition season, you can only control what you can control. Do everything you can to keep it simple, professional, et cetera. Be prepared, be a pro, walk in, walk out, leave it behind as best you can. Um, everything else that frustrates you, it's not that it's invalid, but if you bring it into the room, it certainly can't help you. So what is, you know, so it can only, it can only hurt. Um, so I realize a lot of that might've been basic and rudimentary, but that is my advice on uh, auditioning. Um, and next week, I think I, I, I may have more interesting things to say about getting auditions, maintaining contact, networking, um, stuff like that. Um, Great, so that's the lecture. Are there any questions? Um, please go ahead and use the raise hand function in the participants menu. Um, I will check the chat while that's happening. Oh, okay, all right, we got a few on this one. Um, Emily, I'm asking you to unmute. Hi, so Hi. how are you doing, Charlie? Good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. So you were talking about, you know, when you are going in to read for a play and you're asked to bring your own monologue and you're trying to match something to a part that you'd like to be cast in. Yeah. What do you do when there's a play where you see multiple parts that theoretically could be really good for you, but they're very different? Like in my case, where I'm a little androgynous, sometimes if the companies are open into that, I'm reading for male roles. But I'm also hoping I'm hoping to be considered for male and female roles. Yeah, I hear you. I hear Talk you. About when when there's a play that has multiple parts, you're interested. How you go about choosing what you would 
Yeah, I, I'd say, first of all, if you only get to do one piece, I think you do have to make a choice. Pick, pick the part you target. Now, the, you're a, if you show them that you're good, they may well have the idea themselves to try you out for other parts, which is great. But you're not going to do yourself any favors by playing to the middle. So yeah. pick a part to target. Um, and if there are, and if, in, as in some cases, you get to do contrasting pieces, pick two pieces that may play to different ones. You know, uh, use the material if you have the time. But I do think you have to make a choice. If you go for the so middle. If you're making that choice, you personally, I'm asking. Yeah, do, yeah, yeah. You, do you go with, well, they're going to see, like, every actor knows what's unique about them, hopefully, and what's uh, more commonplace and stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and what things they tend to get typecast as and what things you want to do, but you know nobody sees it in you. Do you go for, well, this is the part that would be the dream role, but they're going to see 500 ingenues for this and they're not going to consider depends. me. It depends. So. Or do you go, yeah, oh, well, I think I'd probably have the best shot at the, the clown role at this. It depends. To be brutally honest, that would have everything to do with how much they were going to pay me. Um, well, if, I, yeah, in my case, it doesn't matter because I don't do it for money. So, And if it doesn't matter, then you should always go for the part you want. Yeah, even if you don't think it's the one they're the most likely oh, to see. Yeah, from. I mean, I mean like, like for me, obviously, hearing my voice, seeing my things, I am not a traditional ingenue. And that's a big pet peeve of mine is the double standard of that. A, I'm not enough of an ingenue to be a, a Juliet, an Ophelia, whatever, unless the director has a really unique vision for it. And usually, or, but then I see violas that are like, so ingenue that you're like, how stupid would these people have to be to, to think for a minute that this was, and I'm like, well, then that should be me, shouldn't it? But then, you know, like. I, I, I hear you and I, and I understand your frustration, but I, I, this comes back to controlling what you can control. And yeah. if you're doing it, and if you're doing it purely out of love of it, which I, I love and I encourage, I would encourage you always to target the part you want to play. Maybe you'll open their eyes. Maybe you won't book it. But how many times are you going to play the part you don't want to play until you just get so fucking sick of it? I mean, yeah. go for... Now, look, if there's a director you love and really want to work with, um, maybe you target the part you're writer for, quote unquote writer for, just because booking the job to get to work with that person would be worth it. You can yeah. parse the surrounding details, but... Overall, if it's not about the money, if it's not about an exterior detail like that, I would always target the part you want to play. Um, people's minds will change slowly sometimes, but you can be a part of changing them, hopefully by blowing them out of the water and booking the role and showing them that it can be done. Um, that would be my encouragement. Thank uh, you. Yeah, of course. Of course. Thank you, Emily. All right. Uh, Julie, I'm asking you to undo this. Hi. Um, so I've always had sort of this question about like the Shakespearean uh, monologues. When you're picking a comedy mo monologue, does it need to be like laugh out loud funny? Because no. I no. don't feel like there are as many that really fit that box. No, and please don't try. Yeah, don't. Don't. <laughs> don't. And it is, it's a, you know, comedy. I mean, I, many of Shakespeare's comedies are very funny, but but th that's actually not what the literary distinction means in this case. Uh, so it is, if they're asking really what most do a lot, you know, if they're asking for two contrasting, uh, the, con the contrast means more, but no, the romantic speeches are all comedy. I would, I would very rarely go for the big laughs unless you're a great, a great clown. It's going to be very hard in an audition room. Um, okay. That's something I'd always just wonder. Cause I was like, I where would you even find that most of the time unless yeah, it's something I mean, bottom you know few, but i don't stress that no <laughs> okay not, you know you might not want to pick one of the heart you know for for instance you might not the the beatrice monologue we worked on earlier tonight that is from a comedy but it is such a rage filled sort of <laughs> tragic monologue you would not want to do that as a comedic monologue so you do have to parse it but, okay but you know as long as it's not heavily dramatic um a comedy is a comedy and there's also you know you could do the porter from the scottish play i mean they're comedic pieces from tragedies too um i wouldn't let it don't let it bother you just just pick a nice piece that you like from a comedy so just kind of go more with what the monologue 
is similar to than necessarily if the play itself is technically classified as a yes comedy. Yeah, don't worry about that distinction at all. Pick a, pick a piece that relates to the part you're going for. Okay, cool. Great, thank you, Julie. All right, uh, Austin, I'm asking you to unmute. Hello again. Hi, sir. Um, so you, you mentioned getting the auditor's names. Is it commonplace for that to be posted yeah, somewhere? Yeah, in, in any equity open call, they should be written. There should be a oh, okay. with them written. You can always ask the um, monitor there. Um, most breakdowns will tell you who's in the room. Mm. You know, um, most, if I ever had a question, I would go to the monitor, whoever's running the sort of outside of the audition and just say, yeah. will you, can you tell me what the name of the, the real people you're looking for a director, artistic director and or casting director. You don't need everybody's name in the room, but those are the, those are the three. Okay, director, artistic director, and casting director. Yeah, those Got are. Um, so yeah, they're often listed on on the wall. They're usually listed in the breakdown. And if you have any questions, I would I would follow up with the monitor running the audition. And just ask for the information. Okay, and you said one. You know, you get that, and then afterwards you follow up with these people. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, it depends on the context. It depends on how well I know them. I'll talk about this next week, but if it's okay. an open call, I'll usually just throw, I'll send a postcard their way. Um, mm -hmm. If it was, if I got a call back or something, I'll probably make it longer than a postcard. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll address that next week, but anything to just remind them you exist, just constantly reminding them that you exist. Just show up at their house. Like, hey, don't do that. I, I, this is <laughs> recorded too. I don't, I don't want anybody to come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, but, but yeah, I mean, look, I'll say it next week, but this is about who, you know, it is auditioning sucks. It's a terrible way of picking people for a play. I don't have a better alternative, but, uh, with the, with the general death of repertory companies, with the general death of resident companies, the best way to cast an actor is to, know, I mean, it's, it's how I get most of my jobs without auditioning. I work with directors and artistic directors that know my work. No, I kick ass and and why risk it on somebody you don't know hire somebody you know and think is great um now I do think some auditioning to mix in some new blood is is a great thing but like when I see breakdowns auditioning for a Hamlet or a Scotsman I'm I think they're crazy how can you your play lives or dies on this casting decision you're going to do it off a monologue I just yeah. I it does happen. I just think it's it's insane. So all that to say, the the better you can build connections. Yeah. Little piece by little piece. Doesn't give you a career, but it gives you it starts giving you the tools of one. But right. again, next week we'll talk a lot more about that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. All right. Michael, I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah, I wanted your opinion on this is mostly regarding auditioning live. Maybe, maybe we could, maybe you could talk about it too for Zoom and stuff. But like, you know, when you're doing a direct address to the audience monologue in front of auditors, you know, should you should you imagine like, you know, there's a whole lively audience there and even the reactions, or should you just kind of, you know, put it straight out? That I that's a good question. I think it's based on the kind of monologue. Um, if you're doing Mark Antony. You should you should create a crowd for yourself. You know, um, if you're doing uh, Brutus's, it must be by his death. I think it could be either. You could you could pick one spot to talk to, or to be actually. You know what? Now that I'm answering the question, Michael, most of the time, I try to take in the room. I try to take in multiple places. Um, there are some speeches that are clearly to one person or about one subject that you might want to focus down more, but I often open it up. Now on camera, I do not. On camera, I pick a place and I stay there. Um, okay. If it is a direct address soliloquy, my instinct used to be to say it to the camera. I've now heard a few casting directors tell me they don't like it. Um, I don't know if that's always true with Shakespearean soliloquies. That, that, that was sort of a more general note on audition videos. Um, I don't know, man, it's hard. There's a different answer for all of these. If you're doing a soliloquy, 
I would try to I would try to hit multiple points personally in general. In my as opinion. if there's audience members there and yeah, yeah, as if there's multiple people that I'm addressing. So I'm I'm speaking some of it here and maybe I adjust as I take a shift and I go up here with it, but I'm not imagining them hooting and hollering or, or going wild or anything. Just just picking different points to maintain my concentration and to have different pieces of the discussion while I go through it. Yes, I think I okay. often do that. Um, right. But it's an it's a good question, Michael, because now that I'm thinking about it, I don't actually know, but I think that is generally what I do. Um, yeah, I was just curious. Yeah. All yeah. right. All right. I, uh, Ariana, I'm going to ask you to unmute, and this will be our last question here. Okay. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Um, so my question, it might actually be something that you might prefer to address next week. So feel free to just like push it off if you feel it goes better with next week's lecture. Yep. Um, but my question was about resumes, which you mentioned earlier. And you said the most important thing that you can have on your resume is the directors you've worked with. Yes. So my question is um, for, uh, for someone whose resume is pretty thin, um, yeah. do you think it's worthwhile or advisable to include um, things that would round it out. So for example, an understudy, uh, if you understudied something but didn't actually go on in performance or um, other kinds of theater work, not acting, but say uh, directing, design, dramaturgy, dialect coaching, that uh -huh. kind of thing. Um, so, just to show that, you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally do, I totally yeah. do. I Understudies, yes. Don't lie about them, put the little like, U slash S thing. Um, mm -hmm. Understudies, yes. I wouldn't put any of the rest on it with the possible exception of some, maybe in your special skills, adding, you know, X years experience as a voice and text coach. I only say that because an auditor might look at that and go, right, she has a bunch of experience with text. So it might help your chances in one, one small world or another. But dramaturgy, directing, scenic stuff, I, I think it's wonderful. It would be, I, I, I think people, I actually think an auditor would be smart to take that into account because this is a woman of the theater. She's experienced it. I don't think they'll help you. Um, I, I don't think those credits will help you on the resume. Um, if you're just looking to pad it out, you could put X years experience at certain things under your sort of special skills section or training section. Um, mm -hmm but I don't know that they'll help. I don't okay. know that, that totally, yeah, that totally makes sense. It's more about sort of where, it, the fine line of, of being like, uh, you know, beginning in being a beginner in the field of acting, but not being a beginner in the sort of performing arts world generally. Oh, oh I get it, I and get it. All, yeah. Yeah, I think a, a few notes, maybe voice and text about years of experience might help. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and if you're really worried about padding it out, you can always, I don't know. I never out and out made shit up, but I would take the smallest little thing and make some, and make it a, a bigger thing on the resume. I, right. If you need to pad it, I say get creative and pad it. Um, but it is, I get it. It's a, it's a tough spot to be in. I get it. Um, to be fair, once you're in the room, I don't think a thin resume will hurt you too much if you do good work and they're interested in working with you. Okay, cool. Um, I will chat a bit more about resumes next week, but um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that's my, I think that's my advice on that. I, I remember having to pad mine out a bit. I, I, I understand <laughs> it, but if you keep working and you keep auditioning, it'll stop being a problem soon enough. All right, great, thank you. All right, thank you, Ariane. All right, all. Uh, good stuff. Uh, East Coasters, I'm going to throw my Venmo up into, oh, I should stop recording. Have I done that? Yes. There we are. <laughs>